uh, I would like to thank everyone here. Uh, this is the last webinar of Open Continuum and Task Force 2, Open Source Engagement. Today, we are going to talk about open source and business model with a practical example. And we are thanking our uh, two speakers, Gail Brundel and Angelo Corsaro. So from Eclipse Foundation and Zetascale. As I mentioned before, this is uh, an event prepared uh, in the open continuum that is uh, uh, European Cloud to Age IoT and uh, initiative and is uh, about task force to open source engagement uh, in particular with the research team of eclipse foundation i would like to remember you that we are going to record this session so please unmute yourself and if you don't want to be recorded close your camera and also uh, there will be uh, a time for question Okay, so please raise your hand in case you want to uh, shoot a question or you can write a question into the chat that will be then re uh, re read after. You can see from, uh, from your uh, screen all the buttons that we already mentioned. So uh, the agenda for today uh, is uh, uh, this. So we will have the first talk about open source and business model in which uh, Gael Blondel, that is the chief membership officer at Eclipse Foundation Europe, uh, GmbH, will introduce uh, uh, the relation between open source and business models. And then we will go into more, we will go into detail in the second talks with Angelo Corsaro, that is the chief executive officer and the chief technology officer at Zetascale Technology co-founder that will uh, give us an overview of a practical example of business model and open source. Now I can give the floor to our first speaker that is Gael Blondel. Uh, I'm thanking you and I will uh, release my screen so you can share yours. Just you are muted. Okay, do you hear me now? And do you see yes. my screen? Yes, perfectly. Wonderful. So, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm I'm very excited to, to give this presentation this afternoon uh, because, uh, or, well, when you think about open source and, bi and business models, I can say that I learned it's uh, the hard way, uh, because in my in my thirties I had this uh, interesting idea of creating a, an open source startup, and um, at the point I, I I was certain I wanted to do open source, uh, but I was not very familiar with uh, with those business models and how how open source and business models fit uh, fit very well together, and it's it's bef it's. Uh, just before I was hired by by Zikli Foundation, that I started to to better understand business models. So well, I'm I'm very happy to be here today to share a bit of my experience uh, over those years, and and also to share the stage today with uh, Angelo because that's super important to to have a, an entrepreneur coming to us and telling how uh, what what he has to, how he has to deal with uh, uh, finding the right mix between uh, supporting open source projects and developing a company. Uh, but before we start, let's let's start with 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 an important reminder. Uh, okay, so the the story started in 1984 when with Richard Stallman at MIT. I guess you you all heard about it, but otherwise you can go and. On Wikipedia and uh, and look for for free software and for Richard Thurman. Um, but uh, one thing that is very important is to understand is that open source is uh, free software is not about the fact that software should be free like gratis like uh, you don't have to pay for it. 
It's about the freedoms of users uh, regarding to the software. So you have four, four main freedoms, four important freedoms. The first one is to run the program for any purpose, and the any purpose is super important. The second freedom is to study how the program works and, and to be able to, to change it, to make it do what you wish. The third freedom is to redistribute copies. And the fourth freedom is to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. Um, just I will not enter the, the differences between free software and open source. I think that for what we have to discuss today, we can consider that free software and open source has been has been have been almost synonymous for for more than twenty five years now, and I would say that it has enabled our digital world as we know it today. Um, but one one thing I would like to add is that open source is a flavor of intellectual property management, and that's that's still uh, that's something I I say regularly, but that's still important to to understand the mechanics of the author of an open source project deciding to publish their, their code under a specific license. The consumers uh, can decide to consume the code under this specific license. And the beauty of it stands is in really two aspects. The first aspect is that the contract is very short. That's two, three, four pages long most of the time. And the second aspect is that the, the legal framework is understood globally in, in a similar way. So I, I always like to mention that because from a developer perspective, when we think about open source, we almost always think about you know, uh, the open source community, the community of developers, et cetera. But, but it's important to keep in mind that it's because of this legal framework and because this legal framework is easily uh, usable everywhere, that we can do what we do. Uh, another thing that I would like to, to cover quickly is about what is not open source. And publishing, so if you are in a research project, for example, and you publish, you decide to publish the, the code on GitHub just for the final review, that's likely not good open source. That's, that's uh, abandoned where. Um, and also, if you publish a code on, uh, somewhere on public repository without adding a proper uh, open source license, then it's not open source because you, as, a, as an author, you have to decide what license you want to use for your project. Um, and the, the last two topics are, are maybe uh, something that you are less familiar oui. with, but... Uh... Oui, oui, bonjour, bonjour. Ça va? Tu vas bien? Yes, but you're not on mute. Oui, ça va, ça va. Alors, euh, je suis en réunion euh, webinaire. Yes. Là, euh, que je... Thank you, Philippe. Um, okay. So let me let me continue. <laughs> uh, source available and ethical uh, source. So that's uh, that's two things we have seen over the last few years. The first one is uh, coming from lots of startups who at some point decided that open source was hindering them from doing more revenue, and and they decided to move. Okay, we used to, to we we were using Apache software. Uh, license, but we think that if we move to something different, we will get more customers. And they created uh, some kind of source available licenses. And those source available licenses, um, they publish the source code, but they restrict what you can do with the software. Like if you use it not only in uh, for for research, but you use it in production then the license is, doesn't allow you to do that and you have to get a contract, for example. So it's just not open source, it's it just not open source uh, licenses. And so the last point is that, well, people try to, to explain that you can use my project only to do the good. Don't use my project for even. As pro that, that's, that creates tons of problems. First problem is who decides what is good, what is bad. Second and 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 second problem is that it it can differ from where you live, for example. 
And third problem, uh, and in, in general, it creates lots of uh, legal uncertainty. And one thing to keep in mind is that open source has been successful because it brings legal certainty. Now, after this short introduction, let's move to uh, open source uh, and business models. So um, I, I remember being in Toulouse at one of our events uh, when, when Simon Phipps was uh, the president of the Open Source Initiative in 2018, I think. And he, he was giving us uh, the 20th anniversary of the Open Source Initiative. And he had a line saying, well, open source does not have a business model. Companies do. And if you want to investigate a bit more about this uh, punchline to some extent, I would, uh, my advice would be that you, you go and read those two articles from Steve Worley. So one from 2016 and the, the follow up in 2018, which is there is no open source business model and there is still no open source business model. And if you want to go one step further, um, I had the, I was lucky to be in this conference, uh, State of the Open conference in London in uh, early February, just after FOSDEM. And Steve Worley and Jeff Burek, who have been doing open tools for, for 20 years or maybe more, um, uh, at this uh, closing session, which is which was about is there an open source business model? So I we, we will provide the link to the to the slide and and the link to watch the video, but um, more or less you had two positions. The position of Steve Worley is that there is no open source business model, like he wrote in his articles, and the position of Jeff Burek is that well you know open source is a mindset. And, and that results in several business models over, over years. The business models around open source have evolved. And, and the, for example, from an IBM point of view, the, the fact that IBM embraced, his point was that the fact that IBM embraced open source has also uh, not only helped open source, and that's, you, you can look at the statistics, that's, like, that's, that's true but also helped IBM uh, find their business models around, around open source uh, projects. We come back to that. So more or less, all of that to say, well, if you think about open source, you have the four freedoms and the open source definition, which is the same thing, but expressed more precisely in 10, uh, 10 clauses of the open source definition. Um, and there is nothing in there that tells you how to build your business model. And the business model is really the point where a company as a CEO, as a CTO, as an executive of an organization, you have to find the way to, to sell something to your customers. And, and so, well, may I guess some of you know the business model canvas that has been there for 15, 20 years, I think. And the idea in the, in the business model canvas is that, okay, you need to start with what is your value proposition? Who are your customers? How do you make revenue? What are your channels to, to reach out to your customer? What is the, the kind of relationship you have with your customers? Um, and, and when you go to the left, it's more about the cost and delivery. So what are your key activities to deliver the value proposition? What are the key resources? What is the cost structure? And who are the key partners? And <laughs> let's uh, let's look at a, a few examples was that that well we have been uh, a few a few examples of uh, business models and of companies that I have been using those those examples. So let's start with for example the specialized technology provider business model. So typically here you are talking about a small company. I, well, in, in, my ecosystem, in our ecosystem, I'm thinking about companies like OBO, Typefox. Maybe, uh, Angelo, you will tell us later if this, uh, if this is, if you put uh, um, Zetascale in this category or in another one. Uh, but more or less, that's, that's companies that have a strong expertise in an open source ecosystem and they build, they lead open source projects 
they also build open source prototypes, which is, you know, uh, open source projects with lower um, maturity level. And, and they need the key resources to make this work is to have a, an, a research and development team. So that's, that's SMEs, but large enough to have a, a decent research and development team. And one of the key activity is to contribute to the communities because that's through the open source communities that those small companies can, can get um, visibility, can, um, and, and can also to some extent find their customers. That's usually in, in the open source communities that, hey, there, is, there will be a large organization that will be looking for, for a kind of technology and go to the well-known open source communities and, and they will find this open source project that is supported by, by this company. So yeah, I was, again, I was thinking about OBO type folks, for example, that's typically the, the kind of business model they, they apply. And sometimes they move to another business model, which is the next one, which is having supported products. So building products and here, what I mean by building product is that it's it's like putting this product in a box and being able to sell licenses to your to your uh, <laughs> to your customers. So of course, this product will most of the time be made of lots of open source uh, projects plus some added uh, features. And the goal here is to is is to get a recurring sub subscription contracts. Uh, and or licensing revenue. And one of the key activities here, it's a integration of free software. Of course, you need to have the, the technical skills to integrate the free software, but also you need to develop the skills of doing product management and, and, and of testing your project, et cetera. Uh, interestingly enough, that's the model that Red Hat has been using forever. Because when you when you when people think about Red Hat, most of the time they think that well, Red Hat is, has been selling support subscriptions for forever. But that's a bit more than that. Uh, this this is a snapshot of their homepage of a few years ago, and I like the idea of uh, what they were uh, selling at the moment uh, with as their as their unique value proposition. When you get Red Hat, you don't just get Linux. You, you get a Linux that has been tried, tested, and that you can trust. And in another slide deck that uh, Red Hat used to, to be using for new employees, they, there was this interesting slide saying that, OK, consider Linux, that's 50,000 packages. Fedora, or community, the community version, is 5,000 packages. And Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the product, so the product means product management and QA, uh, it's uh, 1,500 uh, packages, but you get 24 seven uh, support on it. You get security updates, et cetera, et cetera. So, and you get better integration too. You, you know that those 1,500 packages work together because that's, that's been test, it's been tested. Uh, last example, the co-creation of open source extensible platform. And this is maybe something that is more interesting in the, in, in, in the context of uh, open continuum and the EU Cloud Edge IoT uh, uh, platform. Because here, the idea is the, the value proposition is you have a game-changing technology. You could keep it for yourself. But at some point, you realize that if you publish this game-changing technology in open source, if you enable a platform ecosystem, if you, if you, if you build this, this big co community, including with your competitors, then you will be in a position that you, you can uh, really uh, change, uh, conquer the world with this, uh, with this new platform. And in addition to that, you reduce the platform cost because everybody collaborates under the, around the same platform. And, and the key resources here is that you need enough R&D to make it happen. You need technology leaders. 
and and you need an extensible architecture because otherwise it, it cannot work. Um, I take I just want to put a few logos on this uh, on this slide to to give example. So let's let's start with the Eclipse IDE for example. That was created 20 years ago, and it was a game changer at the time. The fact that it was it was designed to be extensible with an OSGI kernel, etc. And and the fact that we we have seen over the over the years uh, thousands tens of thousands of um, of plugins built on top of the of the Eclipse platform. Uh, think about Hadoop. Hadoop that was created in two thousand six, and and after that that created a swarm of big data projects in the in the Apache uh, Foundation. Uh, think about Kubernetes. Kubernetes was created by a few people from the Borg team at, at Google. And you know, there were not 200 people creating Kubernetes. But uh, that was a game-changing platform. And, and when Google decided to create the to open source it and to create the CNCF, etc., well, the result now is that all your projects are using Kubernetes. So when you think about, about, about it. That's a game-changing uh, approach. And well, I will also mention uh, Eclipse SDV because I think that it's, it's interesting to see that more than uh, 50 automotive companies gather there to create the next generation uh, automotive open source platform. And you are also part of it uh, at Zeta scale. Um, now, uh, I'm close to the end of my presentation. And I, I try in this slide to show how what you have in open, what you do in open source can influence a business model. So let's let's think about you know the value proposition. So you can integrate in your value proposition that hey, part of it is open source. And one thing that is very important here, I was talking about all those companies that decided to go away from open source. I I think that when you decide to put something in open source, it's very bad to step back. So you decide to put something in open source, don't fail the community. The community expects that what's open source will stay open source and will be actively developed in open source. Uh, in terms of who you are addressing with open source. So you know, there's the, there is the, this saying that you have the free riders, so all the users of your technology. Imagine you have 1,000 free riders, you may have I don't know, 10 customers that you can extract from those free riders. And from that, you have potentially one organization that can become a potential contributor and, and then move from not only being, well, move from not only being a customer, but also being a partner. And that's also the, the magic of open source ecosystem is that customers and pat partners will find you uh, if, <laughs> If you have a good open source project and you promote it properly, and and then they that that's what makes your um, your your ecosystem uh, stronger. In terms of activities, of course, you need to contribute to the project. So uh, open source is for the companies that have developers. Uh, you need to to also lead projects and to invest in community management, because to some extent, the only community you get is the one you develop. And the key resources as are your open source committers and also early adopters. That's those people from the community that are excited from the beginning with your project. Um, in terms of revenue streams, I think that it's interesting to see that uh, you can get public funding to bootstrap your project. Maybe not that you cannot make a living and you should not try to make a living of public funding. But bootstrapping a project with public funding is certainly smart. And then defining a product that, that enables you to get product revenue. And in terms of cost structure, that's more or less related to the key activities you get here. Uh, it's the compensation of the developers, uh, also, participation in events or in uh, open source foundations, for example, when you want to show leadership. And, and well, 
Ultimately, the target is also cost reduction of your overall development because well, you expect uh, also to work with, with your partners and competitors. So as a conclusion, not everything has to be open source. I, I think that when people tell you that everything has to be open source, that's not a good advice because it's very hard to, you, you need to find your, 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 uni, your unique value proposition. You need to build your product and what makes the product, it's likely not open source. It can be additional components. It can be just pure services, etc. But it's important to understand that uh, the CEO or, or the director of a, of a research lab is the one who needs to decide what should be open source and and what should be uh, what should be kept as a this added value that you will sell to uh, to to your customers or or use to build partnership. Uh, Definitely, open source is an opportunity for Europe. I, not only because, well, in our European projects, etc., we have we are we have strong uh, incentive to to do open source, but also because you know I live in Toulouse. I'm in my I'm in my office in Toulouse, and well, um, I'm I'm doing open source, and I'm uh, leading an open source uh, foundation, and like I could do it from everywhere in the world. So that's uh, with 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 open source, um, Europe is uh, at the core of the ecosystem. So that's a good way to grow skills in Europe and to and and with also you know uh, the legal playing field being uh, being a level playing field, uh, starting to leverage our skills, our knowledge, and our ecosystem to thrive at the uh, globally. And finally, that's uh, that's uh, my my last point is that we can conquer conquer the world with open source. I mean, think about it. Rest was was a, a PhD thesis. Uh, Psyche learned started as an open source project and is now uh, used by uh, uh, millions of people. Um, so we have examples of projects that started. And because they were open source, managed to to be to get a worldwide adoption. And so don't be shy, do open source, do it properly, and, and think about the fact that it can multiply the impact of what you do. And that's it. And I think we may take questions at the end or uh, I think the same. So uh, also because I don't see any question in the chat and I don't see raising hand. So I think that we can go on with our second speaker that is Angelo Corsaro. You are free to share your screen. Okay, I'm sharing okay. my screen. So you should be seeing my title slide. Can you? Yes, yes, it, perfect. Yeah, good. So thank you very much for uh, the intro that sets uh, you know, per the perfect foundation for the rest of this webinar. And uh, what I want to do is reiterate um, you know, some of the, of the key points that were made uh, by, by Gael from a slightly different perspective on you know, some of the key aspects of open source. So open source goes, as Gael mentioned, well beyond a licensing scheme. The way in which I look at open source, it's really like an ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem that is based on transparent governance, is led by committed and meritocratic governing team, and which has a very supporting user base. Okay. I mean, that sounds like you know how we would write, write, like to run society, right? Because there is meritocracy, there is transparency, and there is a supporting user user base. But for me, this is the, the model of open source, or at least what we take at Zeta Scale as you know the the open source um, community that we try to establish, establish around our um, our technologies. Now, open source is a common good, okay? But it's a strange common good, and I will get back to that. And I think this is also something we need to keep in mind. I mean, people need to be educated because if everyone would understand and everyone would see open source as a common good, uh, what Gael mentioned before as free riding will be reduced. And um, I'll go. I'll get back to 
uh, free riding because my view, my perspective on free riding is a little bit more narrower. And uh, I'll, I'll try to, to explain how at least I, I distinguish those. But again, open source creates benefits that serves all the members of the community and the society. And Gael already provided several examples of successful open source projects that have literally transformed our society. Now, here comes the interesting part. Differently from goods that you find in nature, like let's say water, okay? Uh, when you have a water source that is usually, well, exclusive, it depends, might be shared between different, sometimes even uh, cities or country, depending on where the well is but it's scarce and consumable. And if you think about software, especially open source, source is not exclusive, is not scarce, is not consumable, right? You can replicate it as many times as you want, it never degrades. But that said, for an open source project to be sustainable in the long term, you have to be able to establish a virtuous circle or cycle where individualistic or you know egoistic individualistic exploitation uh, is minimized because that will eventually lead to a tra tragedy of common. What do I mean with this? If everyone is a free rider, meaning you have you know, the initial team of people that uh, uh, starts building you know, whatever cool open source technology, everyone free rides and nobody contribute back, either you know, in terms of funding or time or whatever, eventually you know, that, is, that, that will lead to a tragedy of common. And I think this has to be understood because only by looking at open source as an ecosystem, everyone can become a responsible citizen in this uh, in this world. And I think we still have quite a bit of uh, you know um, road to do in that in that context. So why open source? Well, <clears throat> there are, I mean, even before business model, right? There is a strategic question. So we have an IP, as Gail was mentioned before, and we are considering to put this IP. Um, in the wild, completely open for everyone to pick. So why on earth would I ever do that? And you know, to make a very coarse grain classification, suppose you are a huge company, like one of the GAFAM, you would do that to establish a platform. And that's what they do systematically, right? They leverage open source ecosystem for contribution, endorsement, testing, right? They literally create hypes around some of their platform and that establish an ecosystem around their commercial offering. And uh, it established ties with respect to their offering, okay? And if you look at how that is used by big company, I mean, it's very successful and paradoxically, you know, makes it harder and harder for a small company to compete into the environment. And so if you're a small company, a very small innovative company, then your question is, hmm, how am I going to be noticed in a world where most people expect software actually to be free, especially to you know get started to uh, do uh, perhaps early development and so on and so forth? Well, then if you're a small innovative company, right, actually going open source, and that's the case of at Zeta Scale, so at least one of the case of Zeta Scale, but I will analyze you know, the different reason why strategically we do open source, and there are really two uh, two cases that, that I will discuss, and then how we do business out of it. But um, let's say the most interesting case, or one of the most interesting case for us is you have a very innovative technology, which by the way, in the case of Zeta Scale, um, was a, a private venture for a few years. And, um, and then we decided to open source because we felt that there was a huge potential, but the only way to get the adoption that the technology deserved and to support the transition um, as we will see in the cloud to a device continuum that it could enable. I mean, the only way would be to make it open source, okay? Because that facilitates the creation of an ecosystem of users and you leverage the community effect to further the growth in adoption. Because all of a sudden, you know, everyone can freely use it. If the technology is great, people like it, they talk with to other people, they become almost evangelist and slowly, it is almost a snowball that start rolling, okay? So this effect is very useful for small company like us, because once again, if you focus and you're committed in building great software, right? All of a sudden, it's like if your effort with respect to making your technology popular are multiplied by the community. And the more the community grows, the more that effects is multiplied, which is very powerful. And it's the beauty of a community. <laughs> well, and again, Community, I you know I fully uh, subscribe to what Gail mentioned, and I will go back to this. I mean, community 
like in any social interaction, I mean, has to be taken with responsibility, commitment, and ethics. Um, and I absolutely agree with some of the points that were raised by <clears throat> Gal before. I mean, you can't fake open source. I mean, there are some companies that do some open source, then once there is sufficient adoption, drop it back, or they use strange uh, licensing. I mean, that doesn't work very well, and it's not very ethical either. So I think that's, uh, I mean, either you do it right, and you do it the right way, or you don't do it. But trying to cheat your way through, I mean, I, I don't think it's it's positive for, for anybody. And for sure, I don't think gives a good uh, a good image of, of the company either. Okay, let's move to business models. So you've taken the decision to do open source. Let's assume, like in our case, you are a small company, okay? How then can you make a company sustainable? Because in the end, as I always say, right, we need to pay salaries. Um, if you have kids, right, you need to, uh, to, to buy foods and uh, ensure education and healthcare to your kids. So we need to make some revenues. And there are different models that you can take to build uh, revenues around business, uh, around open source. Um, to keep it simple, I'll, I've divided this in two four classes, uh, which we'll analyze one by one, looking also at the precondition that need apply for you to be able to deliver and be successful in any of those areas, okay? So you could build a service-oriented company around open source, you could build add-on or verticalization, pass SaaS, or you could embed and open source technologies to create some additional offering. So let's start with services. So the precondition to build a service business model around open source is that first of all, there is a, a sufficiently wide adoption on the open source technology for which you want to provide services. The second point is that if you want to be successful, you better have credibility in that community. So if you want people to call you, right? Uh, you should be an active member of the community, uh, ideally a committer of the project, uh, someone that answers questions in the mailing list, because this is how <clears throat> you will beat your uh, uh, your reference, in a way, your your CV, right? Uh, your online CV, right? By uh, by the level of, again, contribution and, and support that you have shown in the, in the community. Um, and that will inevitably, you know, be the best marketing for your company. Okay. In terms of business model, that's pretty straightforward because you'll be selling training, support, accelerated roadmap, and these kind of things. Now, this company, like any service company, scale in the number of people. So that means that um, you, know, you can start small. You don't have big uh, capex because, um, I mean, you are not doing usually the core of the development, so you don't need to make sure that you can run for, for some times without much cash, uh, okay? So that's that's important. Um, and the other important things to understand, you know, how you position, you have to decide if you want to position your company as a boutique, right, or as a supermarket, which is very different. Boutique means super expert, and company will know that uh, you know, they will come to you for the hardest problem uh, when they need um, you know, to solve complicated problem. The advantage of that is that typically you can get a little bit more margin. And again, it's always you know a matter of the company and that you want to be entered the, the, the what you you know what is your ambition. But again, usually those are smaller company with incredible talented people. One will never scale because that's not a model that scale. But you know you can um, you can live nicely, uh, and I know quite a few companies that have followed that model. The other approach, I mean, again, without wanting to insult anybody, but as opposed to the boutique would be the supermarket, which is, I mean, you lower the average level of competences. You still have a good engineers, but that's the target where company goes typically for open sourcing. And uh, outsourcing, I meant, uh, and um, you know, more general services. Okay, usually this is a model that is taken by kind of bigger companies uh, because all of a sudden it's very resource intensive. Second possibility is add-ons verticalization. What is the precondition? Well, once again, you need to make sure that the the, the open source project uh, has to have sufficient wide adoption, right? And if you want to do verticalization you need to have that vertical knowledge, right? I could take uh, something like Zeno and verticalize it uh, to automotive, as an example, right? How could I do that? 
well, do specific development for automotive and do certification. That's one example, okay? And those things uh, then would be uh, part of the commercial offering. Um, it could be add-ons like tools and so on and so forth. Now, this business model gets closer to traditional software because usually is licensed software, okay? Or subscription, but again, that becomes, um, it really depends on the, on the regional market, um, uh, the vertical, because not all the regions are able to, as, as if you are in the software business, to buy subscription. There are some countries that have to buy licenses, but that's really irrelevant, right? But you're in the traditional um, you know, commercial software licensing model. Okay, and next is embedding. So embedding is really about taking open source, one or more open source technology, composing them uh, in order to, to solve a problem for which some company are willing to pay, okay? Uh, so in this case, you would just uh, you know, create a derivative work that composes multiple technology and, um, um, and commercialize it. Now, when these open source users are free riders, they are the one that gain the maximum profit from the common good without giving anything back. And again, sometimes these companies that build embedding don't even quote that they're using the open source project. And so going back to free riders, right? A free riders is anybody that leverages the, the open source project without giving any form to, of compensation back. Compensation can be monetary, can be in terms of resources. So, you know, I fix bug, I do documentation, or can be in terms of marketing. An endorsement from a company, it's also very beneficial, right, for the community. And uh, so for me, the free rider is the entity that just uses it and, you know, doesn't give anything back. And those are, I think, in the context of open source, unethical uses of open source. And I assume what I, what I say, because this will, will come back in, um, um, in the rest of my presentation. Then you have the pass SAS route. The precondition, once again, is that the open source has wide adoption um, and that the technology has some infrastructural element that lend themselves to automation. And um, in this case, right, your, what you want to do as a company is to leverage an open source um, to avoid um, the user of this open source company uh, to have to deal with the provision, the management, uh, the monitoring of the infrastructural portion of this open source by themselves and provide either a pass or a SAS. Um, example of, of um, I mean, Zeta Scale is an example of this business model, at least one of our business model. Um, if you look at uh, Confluent with Kafka, it's exactly the same. HiveMQ does the same, for instance, okay, with MQTT. Once again, when these open source are free riders, once again, if they are not contributing back, it's you know a case of you know maximum gain for them and uh, like nothing nothing for the open source community, which I think the the, the worst case of of um, uh, free riders, a uh, little bit less uh, penalizing than embedding because in most cases when you do a SaaS, usually is visible the underlying technology that you're using, so there is some form of endorsement that that goes back, but still you know this sense of um, Responsibility with respect to the open source project is quite important and in giving back, it's, it's essential if we want to build, again, a surviving and a successful ecosystem. Okay, so then the question is product or services? Again, product and service company are very different. They are different on how they're structured. They are different on how they, they scale and the, the scale implication. They are different with respect to the required investment and the time to revenue. Just to give you an idea, we are a product company. That means that uh, if we start from scratch and we have no legacy product that can uh, generate revenue, okay, so let's assume that is the situation. If we want to build a technology, well, we need to have cash to invest. Where do you get this cash? Okay, that's the first question. And here it comes, um, you know, either you can get it through some venture capital, you can get it through some uh, uh, European project, you can, um, you know, self-invest. That's another option. And European countries, there are, you know, form of loan that even the government does. Uh, but that's the first step that you need to address. You need some cash in order to cover you uh, to the point that you will start generating revenues. But again, I think you've since the very beginning, 
you need to decide whether you are a product company or a service company. That said, even if you decide to be a product company, especially in your early days, services will be a key element because by the time you can generate revenues through product, okay, it will take a few years. And it takes a few years uh, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have to develop the technology, right? The technology has to be adopted. And depending on the technology, if you're in a B2B market, that could take you know, another 18 months. And so you have to consider that perhaps for three to four years, you will make very little revenues from the product, if not zero revenues from the product. So how do you supplement that? Well, you supplement that by providing services. And what you would want to uh, make sure is that you can find roadmap acceleration services, right? Um, but again, you will keep your organization as a product company and all the services that will be erogating will be typically aligned with that strategy of building a product, okay? Um, I think this is, this is something you have to have quite clear in your mind since the very beginning because the two parts are quite different. Okay, so moving forward, let's look at how and why we do open source at Zscale. So first of all, Zscale is committed to making open source innovation and working with partners to create virtuous ecosystems. I mean, we do open source because we believe in open source. We believe in the you know, positive value that it gives to the society. And we believe in the level of transparency that gives to our customer, okay? The source is there, right? You can see the quality of our code, um, especially for communication protocol, you can check that there are no backdoor. You know, you can easily look at the code, um, do any kind of analysis that you want. We have nothing to hide. So I think that's super important, especially for something that is so, so strategic as a communication protocol. On top of that, based on decades of experience on uh, with protocols and with standard bodies, we have come to the conclusion that sometimes standard bodies can be hindering innovation um, and hindering, in the end, the quality of the result of a given standard. Because after some times, what happens is that eventually, you know, a cluster of a company ends up controlling the standard in a non-meritocratic manner, and uh, that kills eventually the technology. And so this is why at Zscale, we believe that open source is the way to innovate and define open and you know, open source standard in the protocol area. Zscale is leading, and we are the biggest contributor of both Eclipse Xeno and Eclipse Cyclone. And um, the reason why we started this project is slightly different. So Eclipse Cyclone is an implementation of a standard. The standard is called OMGDDS. And um, this is an example of a standard that, for instance, doesn't have a test compatibility kit. That's very unfortunate because uh, that means that essentially it's just a paper standard, but um, you know, vendor sometimes put tons of incompatibility as there is no way for the average user or uh, to, to check the incompatibility. So that wasn't really bad for end users because you know, they were adopting and still adopt this technology, assuming that vendor X or Y is compliant for, with the standard. So I can move from one implementation to the other and then realizing too late, sorry for them, that actually wasn't so easy. And so we felt that situation was just um, you know, unsustainable. And we decided to make an open source implementation of this standard that was the reference implementation for compliance, performance, and security. And once again, here we go back to the transparency, right? Um, we claim to be fully compliant. And it's very easy because if anybody spots or can spot one error of is compliant, you just do a GitHub issue and it will be discussed and fixed. So I think this is how we advance technology and how we make sure, by the way, that uh, you know, the interest of companies and the end user can be made. Because also this is how you create a proper uh, competitive scenario, right? Having an, a standard that actually is full of um, traps for the end users because uh, you know, closed source vendor can have so many way of, of locking you in while you believe that is a standard. I mean, I don't think it's good for creating a proper a proper market because you create lock-in without you know even realizing it. And this is why we open source Cyclone. And by the way, that was our first um, Eclipse project. For Zeno, the scenario was completely different. 
Xeno really is a disruptive uh, technology. Uh, Open DDS is a standard that uh, was introduced more than 20 years ago. Okay, it's heavily deployed from air traffic control management uh, to uh, you know some uh, uh, other aerospace application, but it was designed really for roughly local area network. And the problem we wanted to solve with Xeno was to be able to have a protocol that could unify data in motion, so like PubSub, uh, data addressed, meaning queries and data storage and computation from the smaller microcontroller up to the data center, no matter the kind of network that you had in the middle. Such a protocol didn't exist. Um, we had, um, we developed this actually um, a few years ago in-house. The result was quite successful. And at that point we saw the potential and we decided to open source it. We open sourced again in Eclipse because we felt that it has the right level of governance um, the and which is very important, transparent, open governance, and an ecosystem that could help us really build the, the kind of community that we felt that this protocol deserved. And you know, we've been very, very happy at uh, the growth of the community, as I hope that the community is happy on how we support them and you know how committed we are uh, to them. So again, this is slightly different and goes to one of the examples that Gael gave in which you are trying to disrupt a, disrupt the market, and again, as a small company, how are you going to get attention? Uh, especially with something that at the beginning will look very different from anything else. Open source was great to us, and so today, you know, we have now a huge number of users. It's one of the fastest growing project in Eclipse. This protocol that can run from data link to anywhere higher up has no topological constraint, and in record time was identified as the best protocol in the market for robotics among essentially all the protocol, protocol that were considered applicable um, in the case of um, the robot operating system by Open Robotics Foundation and Intrinsic. I think for Zeta Scale and Eclipse, this is a huge success um, and a great success story of innovation and open source um, going end in end. Obviously this protocol is playing and creating ecosystem and synergies in SDV. Which, which is great. So once again, you know, expanding our, our community. Uh, here is another example of a great synergy that um, um, within a working group that was mentioned before by, um, uh, by Gael. And again, this is once again, the power of open source in action, right? All of a sudden, you know, once you're open source, if you're relevant, other community can use it. And all of a sudden that pool can be used to do additional verticalization. And this verticalization that we did, some of those are completely open source because in the case of Zeta scale, our model is that anything that is in the open source is carrier grade, okay? We don't make the open source good enough. We make the open source as good as, as, good as it has to be. And we always try to make it any better. And even the support that we give in the open source is the best that we can because our philosophy is that I mean, it's not by making the product in the open source just sufficiently good and the support not too bad that uh, you know we will have a great community. I mean, we have very high standard. And on top of this very high standard, we have to create additional differentiation to motivate uh, commercial users. That's at least the way in which we go. So is Zetascale a product or a service company? Well, Zetascale is definitely positioned as a software product company. Okay. In terms of our offering, we have built on top of Xeno a platform as a service. Okay, this platform as a service is cloud independent, so it can run on Amazon, um, Azure, or any other uh, YAS infrastructure, and allow you to provision Zen infrastructure down to your device. It does the security and everything else, and this is pay as you go, or potentially you can white label it. So that's one of the axes of our um, uh, business model. And obviously for this to work, the adoption of the protocol is essential, right? Because the more you have the adoption, let's say robotics or automotive, the more, right, you will have um, a conversion of people that will be interested and in eventually paying for these additional services. The second uh, dimension of our business model is about verticalization and add-ons. So in terms of verticalization, we have verticalization for robotics and automotive. So there are both in terms both of certification so we're undergoing ISO <clears throat> 27001 and 
2626 to certification. Uh, and we have additional tools that are either available as part of the pass or available offline you know, for monitoring, manage, inspecting, browsing your system, and so on and so forth, diagnosis, and so on and so forth. Then obviously we provide services, but just as a consequence of having product, okay? That's not our core business. Uh, for sure we do training, for sure we will do accelerated roadmap, but we are always very careful in ensuring that anything we do right uh, remain aligned with our strategy of being a product company. Now, pro and cons. I mean, it's not easy, okay? And uh, it's not easy and you have to plan carefully because it takes investment. And I don't just don't mean money. I mean, uh, you know, personal investment. And I think anybody that knows sufficiently the Zeta Scale team can understand what I mean with that. It takes perseverance, very strong ethics. I mean, I set myself, I'm, for instance, the project lead of Eclipse Zeno, and I set myself of, as the guardian of our key principle, right? Those are those cannot be uh, diluted or compromised, okay? I think that's super important because it's only by strong ethics and making sure that you are faithful to, to, you, to your community that you can you know, eventually build a successful community and use it as a mechanism to have a successful business. It takes time to generate revenues if you're a product company. You need to understand that and you have to have sufficient water to cross the desert, okay? I think that's very important. What are the pros? Well, obviously, you know, innovative technologies supported by committed and growing core of an open source ecosystem allow you to expand at a rate in terms of adoption that it's much, much higher than you could if you were a small company with a closed source software. Okay. And uh, I think that's the, the biggest pro, uh, along with, um, and, and, and in fact, is the sense of community where everyone, unless, you know, those few free riders, um, uh, is committed to help uh, this this entity, which is this eco the ecosystem around your project, to actually grow and become more successful. And so what is the Zeta scale philosophy around open source? Well, we see open source as a republic in the Plato sense, okay? So a way to create an ecosystem of companies and individuals steered by a wise and benevolent core team that collaborate for greater good, where each party assumes the role with sense of ethics and responsibility. And I think that if everyone, every executive of big and small company would see open source this way, I mean, the world of open source would be much better and uh, fairer. And so I hope that this was interesting. That was my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Angelo. Okay. These are two incredibly presentation, and I think that both speaker were very clear. And uh, we have actually a question in the chat that I can uh, uh, I can read. So uh, the uh, question I read is... it already, if you okay, will, but I will repeat, repeat so that no, no, the... you can uh, you can read and uh, okay. you can. Answer so the question the is how is it a scale? And um, um, any other company like Zeta Scale can benefit from the governance provided by a foundation like Eclipse. And is it applicable to a larger company? So, well, I think that the main difference between, suppose that, let's say, Zen or Cyclone were just a project on GitHub with um, an open source license, okay? The difference is that the governance would have been arbitrary. So, that, suppose tomorrow I wasn't anymore the CEO or whatever, uh, somebody else could decide to change the rule um, and, um, and um, you know, arbitrary, make arbitrary decision perhaps on who can become a committer, right? The advantage it gives Eclipse is transparency, okay? Uh, there are some projects, I won't make name, in which the rules on how you become a committer are non-transparent and are biased. Uh, in Eclipse, that's it, that is entirely meritocratic, and the Eclipse MDO makes you know, a great job in ensuring right, that is as such. And I think there is a guarantee for us, and it's a guarantee for anybody that decides to contribute to a project because they know that if they put in effort, they will get rewards and they will get you know, stewardship in the, in the project. I think that's the first dimension. 
The second one, especially if you're in Europe, not to be underestimated, is the incredible work that Eclipse does as a guardian of open source with respect to some of the regulation and the work they did with the CRA and what they are about to do in order to help open source projects comply with CRA. So there are all the series of benefits that come to companies that decide to um, host their project in, in Eclipse, both in terms of credibility, because the governments, the governance is you know, transparent, open, and really meritocratic and supports. I'll give another one, otherwise it will sound I work for Eclipse. They don't pay me, okay? <laughs> so yeah. uh, that will be clear, okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, I know. It's, 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 I'm talking right No, but just to make clear. So the other point, I give another example: security. So I mentioned CRA. So Eclipse, for instance, uh, also does security and IP uh, review for our code base, right? I mean, there are lots of services that uh, Eclipse uh, provides to project, which you know are, I think are just great and. Um, so I advise everyone, uh, you know, to think twice to just do an, op a, an open source project on GitHub and consider to be, you know, part and member of the Eclipse Foundation because of all these these reasons. Yeah, I on the other side, since I'm working for Eclipse Foundation, I would uh, uh, just add that to what you say in the in the beginning is uh, that the foundation is a, a place in which you are vendor neutral. So that's the point why no one can, uh, let's say, wake up, wake up one day and say, okay, this is everything private. This could be changed, the license or mm, whatever you can think of it. You are no more a committer, yeah, as an example, yes. right? So yeah. Okay, so there is another question asking how does Zetascale manage its user community and whether do we have a dedicated community manager? Okay, so in terms of community management, um, we are on Discord, and that's, let's say, the meeting place for our community. Uh, actually, we don't have a dedicated community manager. I don't know if I have that role without uh, without assuming it, but let's say that all of our R&D team, it's quite present, and there is this sense of responsibility. Um and I, I think that the beauty is that when there is a sense of responsibility, you don't need managers because everyone does the right thing. And that's kind of the Zeta scale approach. Okay. Uh, obviously, I always have an eye. Uh, those of you that have been on, on Discord always know that I answer quite a few questions. And if something is not you know, quickly answered, I always ping the right person that can answer. So in that respect, maybe I'm playing the role, but I don't want to take that merit because the, the reality is that all the R&D team is very dedicated and responsible in that respect. And I think that's the, the philosophy that we have and the philosophy that we try to you know, ins instill and inspire in our team. That's a good base. Uh, but now I have a question for you. How oh. many members do you have to manage? Oh, in our, well, in Discord, more than a thousand. I think around 1,200. Oh, that's a big community then. Yeah. Just on Discord, and not everyone might be on Discord, right? Yeah. Great. That's that's really good. And I don't know if we have other questions. I can see that we don't have other questions. Do we have raise and no? Uh, we still have also our other speaker, Gael Blondel. So if uh, some of you has also questions for him, uh, he can answer. I think that we don't have other questions. Yeah, we have one yeah. from oh. Amir. We have it? Ah, sorry. Oh, yes, we have one. Uh, we have one for Angelo. Yeah. So you spoke about tragedy of commons, and I really like that. Can you give us examples of projects that, according to you, fill into it? Well, I think, yeah, I think, unfortunately, it's the minority of projects that don't fall into it. And it's only successful projects that don't fall into a tragedy of common, because there are lots of very interesting open source projects that are, uh, uh, you know, free rided for sometimes um they don't manage to you know to to probably build 
a community or get um, uh, sufficiently, again, uh, funding, and, and they just starve out of it. So unfortunately, it's something that is more common that, that it isn't. And again, I think this comes from this lack of sense of responsibility. I mean, I, I, I like to give you another example. So if you are in the wild and there is a tree with a fruit, you take it and you don't think about anything because it's the nature that made it. But as opposed to being you know, uh, in the wild, if you are taking like an apple from uh, a farmer uh, land, then all of a sudden, you know, that you are taking that someone else has spent work doing and you feel guilt if you don't pay. The issue is that when people take open source, they think like they are taking, you know, a fruit in the wild. Uh, well, it's not like that. It's more like the case, you know, there was, there were a bunch of farmers that really put all the effort to, to grow that. And you should feel you owe something. And I think that's the only way in which we can build community that, uh, that really strive and are well balanced. Uh, Gael, do you have... Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I think, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, well, uh, that's an interesting answer. I think that uh, there has been always for the last few years, lots of questions about the sustainability of open source. And I think that this topic of sustainability of open source and this, and this topic of uh, <laughs> open source, uh, well, business models are very related. One yeah. thing to, to keep in mind is that um, yeah, at some point, you, you, you have two categories. You have uh, collectives. So if, if you have something that we think as a society that should be collectively developed, etc., so maybe your governments should find a way to fund it. And that's, uh, that's one scheme that we don't see so often. We can see yes. it to some extent, but not so often. Mm -hmm. and, for, for, and, and for what is not a collective or what is not a, a common, I strongly believe, and that's what we promote at the Eclipse Foundation, that, well, you need to find your business model. And, um, and like you said, um, the, I like your, your idea of uh, you should feel guilty if you take an apple and uh, and don't yeah. pay for it but i i guess that over the years you have also come to to the conclusion that guilt is not a good driver for revenue so no i understand but you know it's the perspective that free riders should have you see what i mean yeah, sure yeah because in the end as i said there are multiple ways of contributing back Right. And uh, yeah, the, the words for open source are those that just take without giving anything back. And actually, it's a non negligible portion. And I think that's a matter also of education and talking about this, you know, it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I came to the conclusion at some point that, well, you need to have something that is that, well, my, my slide about not everything has to be open source. Uh, uh, and yeah. if you want your life to be easier and, and you had something similar with, you know, adding uh, components, yeah. non-open We have the pass, we have the advanced absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the right you, way to, start, to yeah. start finding your... your... I, I fully agree. My point is that if there would be more responsibility, you know, you don't know how many times we hear, yeah, it's open source, why should we pay for it? Well, yeah, again... Well. Education. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because as someone used to say, it's free like in free speech, not in free beer. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yes. I think that we don't have other questions. Am I right? And not end. So I think we are good to go. And uh, before closing, I want to thank everyone. Uh, this was a, a very interesting webinar. It was the last one of uh, a, a series of webinars that we made in Open Continuum. I would love to thank again the two speakers of today webinars, and uh, I I hope that uh, we will continue this in the future. So I I wish you a wonderful day. And I will close now the call. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very you much. everyone. Thank you.